Hello and welcome to another episode of the Master Mind, Body, and Spirit Show. I'm your host, Matt Belair. Today's guest is the founder and vice chairman of Alfion Corporation, a leader in the rapidly growing field of lifestyle healthcare. He is currently the chairman and managing partner at Sprathby Crown and is an independent board member at Myoscience, AccuFocus, and Reshape Medical, all leading lifestyle healthcare companies. Additionally, he sits on the board of, the many, of many university and charitable organizations. He holds a BA from Brigham University and an MBA from Thunderbird and has attended the President's Seminar at Harvard Business School. He is the creator of the Etymology of Number, a course available on the Resident Science Foundation and, and has made groundbreaking mathematical discoveries and most recently, a major new discovery in the Great Pyramid of Giza while on a recent trip to Egypt. Welcome to the show, my friend, Robert Grant. What's up, brother? Hi, Hi good to see you. Good to see you, man. We've been talking about this for a while and uh, every single time we catch up, there's something new and amazing. It's, it's, it's been absolutely crazy. I think since you and I were in Egypt together in October of last year, I, I think it feels like my life's on fast forward right now. And, uh, but it just keeps getting more interesting and better and better and I, I couldn't be happier. I'm loving the moment. Amazing. Well, yeah, it's, it's your background and where, what you've done is so fascinating, you know, business to the max, very successful in that world, accomplished a lot, did a lot of things. And then when I watch your presentation in Egypt, it's all on math, math. And you came to these amazing conclusions through kind of seeing math from a different way from language, because you know how many languages, seven and very good at music. And so you're, you're going into math, which obviously there's correlations there and making these major discoveries, which have now been proven or however that works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. proven. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting. You know, I, I, uh, I was a musician. Um, I had a music major my first few years of college and then, I had to make a choice. Was I going to be good enough as a performance major? I, I was a trumpet player and I was first chair at Brigham Young University, which is very competitive. And I was top in the state uh, before I went to college. And I knew I was pretty good, but I knew I probably wasn't good enough to make a career out of it. So like most people, I think you kind of are forced to make a decision between, you know, kind of a more professional, more dependable career and uh and you're probably early 20s or whether you're going to be an artist or a starving artist or a starving musician and i i kind of opted not to, to have the starving part so i <laughs> i said uh i said you know what I, I gotta buckle down and get practical and so i ended up going to mba school and uh i really enjoyed business and the creativity side of business and i worked in really cool companies both large and small i worked for dunlop a big Sulzer uh, uh engineering company based in switzerland I lived in nine different countries. I became president of Allergan, which is a big pharmaceutical company. Uh, I was CEO at Bausch & Lomb Surgical as well, which is another big pharmaceutical company. And then I decided I just couldn't be evil anymore. That's a joke, by the way. But there's, uh, there's some truth to that because I don't think that the people that work in the pharmaceutical industry are at all evil. But I think to a certain extent, the industrial complex of healthcare has some like unfortunate tendencies associated with it. And so I decided to, to break off of that and no longer participate in that same way. And I guess in healthcare, I'm a little bit of a renegade, a little bit of a rebel. Uh, I revel in my rebellion. And, um, and it's been kind of fun to create the first Medicare opt-out uh, group of companies uh, with Strasby Crown. And now we have 14 companies in our group. And most of them are healthcare, but we also have energy companies too. And we also do investments. Uh, and those of you that uh, know Nassim Haramine, he is uh, a partner of mine, and I was the one that convinced him to move from Hawaii and the entire Resonance uh, uh, Academy and Foundation uh, from Hawaii to Southern California. I'm actually meeting with him in a couple of hours, so uh, looking forward to seeing Nassim and catching up with him. He's a great friend and a brilliant scientist, and we've been collaborating together for quite some time now, about four or five years. So this mathematical journey for me has been one of uh, surprise, I would have to say. I never thought in any way, uh, even five years ago, that five years later I'd be publishing on you know, the first infinite series of prime numbers and proving that to infinity. I never thought that I would be doing that, which then of course that has big implications on math and science and music and geometry and sacred geometry, but 
It also has big implications on cryptography. So, you know, the last few days I've been uh, very concerned because I knew that as soon as we cracked the prime number code into infinity, that some people would look at that in a totally different way and use it for theft or crypto mining or whatever. And unfortunately, I think that's already starting to happen now. Uh, all private keys and public keys of cryptography are associated with prime number indeterminacy, which means it cannot be found. Um, and you have to use massive computer factorization at a huge cost and huge uh, usage of, of energy, electricity, uh, to run the processors. And uh, the last few days, I've had like cryptocurrency companies and blockchain experts come and visit me randomly. And it's been absolutely insane. So like I said, I, uh, I, I didn't expect that I would have this journey culminate into where I am now uh, to create the first true unified mathematical sort of formula that forms the foundation of a unified physics model. And it ties directly to consciousness as well. So uh, I have to say I'm very excited, but also like not sure what's going to happen next because it's just been a whirlwind and a, an exciting and fun roller coaster that I'm enjoying and loving right now. What can I say? Amazing, man. Yeah, amazing. Well, even when we met in Egypt, uh, you did a, an amazing presentation there that I was grasping and trying to figure out what was going on. And then I did the etymology and number course, and that was extremely fascinating. And we've kind of kept in touch since then. And, you know, the, these discoveries are leading kind of opening Pandora's box one after another after another, these implications. Um, and then you went to Egypt and you did some incredible stuff there. You made a major discovery there and, and it's all linked up. Uh, you looked a little bit at uh, Alan Green's work as well as done yeah. some incredible work on the pyramid and mathematics. Um, and, I and, it, it, and he's a brilliant man and I love his work on the constants in the pyramid. And I had come to the same conclusion on the constants as well, just to put it independently. Uh, you know, there's a reason why Isaac Newton and Kepler and all these people that were fantastic, uh, you know, changers of the human condition and paradigm scientifically were all alchemists. They were all avid studiers of the Great Pyramid and the mathematics of the pyramid. In fact, 80% of the work of Sir Isaac Newton was on the Great Pyramid and on alchemy in particular. Bill Gates bought all of that work because Cambridge University disavowed themselves of that work. They were very happy to take his theories on gravity and inverse square law and such, but, and like Kepler as well, Kepler's laws of motion, but they didn't want any of the esoteric or the mystic part of it because what Isaac Newton was trying to prove was that there is a higher consciousness and that higher consciousness creates an order and patterns emerge off of that. And so I kind of took the, opposite approach to Cambridge University because I wanted to understand that better and using my background of language. Uh, I speak Korean, Japanese, Chinese, French, German, uh, Spanish, and Hebrew. And having learned all those languages in a system for languages, I started to number, I started to notice that there is a language embedded in numbers. There's a language, a true language that's embedded in mathematics. And this language is very different. It's a language where numbers are words, individual numbers are words. The mathematical constants like pi and phi and alpha and Euler, those become the verbs of action. And circles in geometry organize the syntax of the language and the communication. And it's kind of like that movie uh, Arrival or Contact where they all of a sudden flipped it and then found a language embedded that they could then interpolate and utilize to, you know, kind of figure out the big, big mysteries of, you know, superluminal travel, et cetera, gravity control, um, wormhole travel, like in the movies. And, you know, sometimes art imitates life. And what we're seeing now is this mathematical complex and this language that comes out. And I teach a good portion of it in the etymology of number course. I'll be teaching an advanced course for those who've already completed the etymology of number course. Um, I teach a good portion of it, but it's continually emerging and on a day-by-day -day basis, we're finding new discoveries. And that means things like the prime number pattern, being able to infinitely generate prime numbers and uh, also new constants, totally new mathematical constants and that the constants are completely interrelated with each other. And often it's as simple as a constant would be the radius of a circle with a, another constant as its circumference. And these are the constancies that interrelate with each other. And in mathematics, everyone thinks they're completely unrelated. But we can prove them now in geometry, and it ties perfectly into music and everything else we see around the world that we live in. And it paints 
all of our experience. And I think one of the big things that we're going to start to see as well is that the way to understand the nature of matter and the nature of light is to truly understand the nature of vacuum, space, and darkness. And that's, you know, a very, very exciting field because once we start to get into that field, then the great, great things that have been absolutely elusive to our understanding as human beings, are, I think are going to be, they're going to come to light and it's going to have a big impact on humanity. Amazing. And does that tie into like, what, like, what do you believe the pyramid is, is trying to show us? Because it's mathematical in, in every way they have the cubit, the centimeter, I think even the mile, like everything is encoded in there. And that's lining up to the math that you're discovering. Uh, so I'm just curious, where do you want to start with it? Like, um, describing some of these things that you've discovered in a way that we can understand what you learned in Egypt, which was pretty incredible, or are the implications that this has on, on the world and the planet? Cause I know that you have a, like a laser company too, or something. Yeah. I was uh, formerly president of a company called coherent medical, which was one of the largest laser companies in the world. So I've worked in photonics for 25 years. I have several patents in the field of photonics as well. Uh, even though I'm a business guy, I've always been one person of very broad interests. Um, you know, art and music and mathematics and science. And part of the message here is that there is something to be said about finding a balanced experience that really balances kind of the five points of a, of a star, which would be, and you find this all the time in alchemy, which is music, math, art, and science and philosophy. And when you balance your mind, then like the other philosophers, as well as what we refer to as the polymaths, the Da Vinci's, the Kepler's, the Descartes, the Voltaire's, the Plato's, the Aristotle's, and the Socrates of the world, and the Pythagoras's of the world, you are able to tap into a, a higher understanding when you can connect the dots across all those disparate fields, which is exactly the opposite of what we learn right now in our current educational system. We are taught, because of commercial reasons, we are taught to, to learn scarcity. And what that means is you want to be the most specified you could ever be, right? You want to, you're going to go into biology. I can't just be biology. I have to be like a nanotechnology, you know, DNA uh, or transfer RNA biologist. And that's all I'm going to focus on. And I'm going to stay in that little zone. And that's not where innovation happens. Innovation happens when you basically stand on top of it, step back, and you can stand far enough from the tree to see the forest. And then utilize learning from one field and apply it to another. And then you start to see patterns and language form. And that's where you get syntactical communication that occurs. And so the current school system and the current paradigm with the mathematics and sciences is all very reductionistic. And it's because the more specified I become, the more scarce I am. If I'm super specified, I get a PhD in something, someone, if they want that thing, they have to pay me more money for that. Well, not everything's about money in this world. In fact, most things are not. And I think we're starting to wake up and understand that, that it's not all about money. And if you really want to tap into a higher cosmic awareness and consciousness, the way and the doorway to do that is through obviously all the mind body stuff that you work on, but it's also about balancing your understanding in each of those disciplinary areas. And when you do that in combination with allowing yourself to you know, replace fear in your life with gratitude. I gave a TED talk on that, and I'm going to give another TED talk soon at the United Nations on replacing judgment in your life with acceptance. When you balance the emotional, the psychological, the physical, the conscious, right, as you evolve in your consciousness, then all of a sudden you start to get this life that kind of turns on its head. And this life that turns on its head becomes one where all of a sudden you're accepting of people around you, you're less judgmental, you're less polarized. And because of that, your existence becomes one of acceptance and happiness and joy. And I think this is part and parcel of the journal, journey that I had embarked on probably four or five years ago, as I dived deeply into mathematics to find that language of number. And I'm excited here to share some of it with you today, and also to share with you a recent discovery that I had in the pyramid, uh, I think I may be one of the only people in history that has now spent three nights in the pyramid. Uh, I did one night with you when we were there in October, uh, October 5th, 2017, 
on that full moon night. It was epic. You know, we did all three pyramids and it's not like the pyramids on Airbnb. You can't like, you know, like find it and like, I'm going to rent this thing, right? It's not how it works. So you definitely have to know somebody. And through that connection and that evening, I ended up becoming friends with uh, a few of the guys that manage the Giza Plateau. And it's been exciting for me because I was back in Israel with about 12 of my friends and they're all CEOs of companies and a group I'm a member of called the uh, Young Presidents Organization. And I invited them to come with me to spend a night in the pyramid. And then I went ahead and asked for it again the next night by myself. So I actually got to do a night in there by myself. And I have to say it was uh, one of the most, if not the most, probably the most amazing experience of my entire life. So I'm happy to share this with this group here. Uh, I've done it three times. I think the the people that have done it all night before by themselves that I know of are uh, basically Alexander the Great. Um, uh, there's also Julius Caesar and Napoleon Bonaparte. I think Aleister Crowley did too, but you know I don't know what his deal was. But uh, I, I heard that he had done that, so you know there must needs be an opposition to all things, I guess. But but that's uh, who knows, right? I'm not going to make, make any judgment. <laughs> So I'd be happy to take you through some of the discovery here. Uh, I have a presentation that I can uh, take you through uh, that I presented at Contact in the Desert a couple of weeks ago. And I was sort of a write in on the schedule at the last second because uh, you know the discovery I had was the first writing found, the first like etched writing that's uh, not believed to be at all graffiti uh, in the King's Chamber. And um, strangely, it was right on the rim of the sarcophagus in the King's Chamber. So I'm going to take you guys through some of that. And the more bizarre part of it was that candidly on the flight from Israel to Egypt, I had been drawing uh, using the Vesca Pisces, the geometry of the letter A and the letter M and Omega symbol. And so I had been drawing it on the flight over there. So I have all my notebooks and everything from that period on the flight towards Egypt from Israel. And, uh, you know, interestingly, those were the symbologies. Those are the symbols that I ended up finding on the rim of the sarcophagus in the King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid. And not only that, but also a circle with a compass uh, right next to it. And I'm gonna show everyone uh, photographs I have of that. And I can tell you, it was very difficult to get the photographs because the Egyptologists that were with me, and I had four with me, they were all pretty much freaking out because uh, they'd never seen it before. And uh, you'll see it and it's quite obvious and it's mind blowing that it hasn't been discovered before. And in addition to that, as you recall, the last time we were in Egypt, uh, a few days after we left, they discovered new chambers above the Grand Gallery using muonic transfer. And that's kind of interesting because the two times I have spent in the pyramid, there have been like significant discoveries that have all of a sudden popped out of those time periods. So uh, I think that raises other questions, but I'm excited to take you through this presentation and uh, thanks again for the invitation. Yeah, man. Thanks for coming. And just as a side note, for those of you who don't know, I highly recommend checking out the course, the etymology and number, but your notebook is extraordinary, you know, uh, and, and, and a lot of this comes back from you. You know, you say, if you want to, your, um, the, the mirror, the mirror of consciousness, you know, you write it down. So you're integrating the math and the artistic side. So you're, you're, you're working with your polarity and growing at an exponential rate. Well, it's funny you say that because I wrote this, I started this book, uh, you know, about uh, July 2014, right? And, and I titled it from the very beginning, The Quantum Mirror of Consciousness. And I didn't even realize that on the cover, I didn't really notice it. I knew it had these sort of like shocker thing. I was looking for a really big book that had kind of like parchment paper. And I just found this in Chakra Shack and I was like, oh, wow, that's cool. But I never noticed that the symbol on here was actually the phi symbol. Right. And the mirror itself of consciousness is based on the mathematics of phi, which is really interesting. So here's your line, like a number one that cr crosses right between the north south axis on a circle, which is very interesting. So, um, yes, I have like lots of stuff in here. I'll just show you a few pages. And these are like my drawings and everything. They've all been registered now uh, with our attorneys. And this is the prime number chart discovery. Um, this has all been registered now with the Library of Congress, actually. Uh, this is kind of like how electromagnetism works, right, along a numerical pattern because everything is number. And this is all the type of stuff that I teach 
uh, in the etymology of number course. And inclusive of this is, uh, you know, all the geometries of what the patterns of rational and irrational numbers are and how they interrelate with each other and how they emerge amid the prime numbers. So uh, this has been really exciting. I was kind of blown away when I, I had lunch with um, one of the top mathematicians in the world, Daniela Strupa, who is at the CEO of uh, Chapman University about two weeks ago. And I showed him the prime number pattern and figured out the pattern to be able to determine prime numbers uh, accurately into infinity without any factorization whatsoever by discovering a different type of prime number. So the answer to finding prime numbers into infinity was to understand that there are three types of prime numbers and one of them had never been discovered before and they're called quasi prime numbers. And those quasi prime numbers are divisible by other prime numbers and products of prime numbers that are greater than the number five. So it's a new type of prime number and they all line up perfectly in the same moduli of where the prime numbers line up on a 24 hour clock. Now, what's interesting from that is that by understanding how the prime numbers operate and how you can create the products of primes and that creates all the quasi primes, all the numbers that don't get generated on the chart into infinity and we've now proven it on supercomputers and such, as well as with infinite equations, uh, all the numbers that don't get generated are by definition prime. And nobody believed me, even my own research team. They're like, this isn't gonna work. I said, just run the calculation. I did it on the back of an envelope on the flight to uh, Salzburg, Austria about a week ago. And they're like, no, this isn't gonna work. I said, just humor me, please run the calc on a spreadsheet, a regular spreadsheet. And all of a sudden I said, just run it up to 10,000. And one of my colleagues here, Nauman, says, I, okay, I'll do it, I don't think it's gonna work. He ran the calculation and he sends me an email like at midnight that night saying, holy shit. <laughs> He's like, this worked. I don't understand why it's working, but we accurately predicted every single prime under the number 10,000. And I was like, okay, cool. So it's exactly, it sort of proved the theory. Then we tested it further over the course of the next few days and we published it the next day. And of course, we've had every crypto person <laughs> imaginable like call us up or like write on the page, it's like kind of nuts, totally nuts. Uh, we didn't do this so that we could crack cryptocurrency, even though every encryption on the planet is tied to prime number indeterminacy. Well, if it becomes determinacy, not indeterminacy, then you got a real problem with all encryption. So we are trying to figure out the way to, uh, to create a new encryption now that is fifth dimensional. And uh, I've been working on this for the last couple of days. It's very exciting stuff. And it will be uh, what I'm referring to now as an infinite series of oscillating cryptography. And it'll be infinite. There's not going to be any more like 256-bit encryptions and stuff like this. We're going to kill all of it. And none of it's going to be prime determined either because we know that that's inherently now weakened because you can predict primes into infinity now. So, you know, these are obviously all these big equations, et cetera, I've done all of this work. Um, and, you know, I would say that just off of this chart of figuring out, you know, all the prime numbers, and of course it has the shape of a Templar cross, which is very interesting because what it says is that maybe somebody understood this before in ancient history. Maybe this isn't such a new invention after all. Maybe it's just a, an opening, right, of consciousness that was already available. And I'm not the one who's gonna try to conjecture that point right now. All I can say is I do believe higher knowledge is on the planet in the past. And I think the pyramid is probably the most salient example that we could ever find because every major mathematical constant, even the ones that were not discovered until the 20th century, are embedded in that one piece of incredible architecture. So, and I'm gonna take you guys through some of that. So, if you like, I'm gonna go ahead and do a share screen now. Okay, and right here. You're in. Okay, let me hit play. Okie doke. All right, so, this is the pyramid. Uh, obviously a familiar sight to everyone, even those who haven't visited the pyramid. And off here to the left, you'll see the sarcophagus, it looks like there's a Y shape there. Lots of people ask me all the time, how did that like side break off like that? I don't have any clue. Um, <laughs> and then uh, you can see at the bottom left, this is the King's Chamber. And Matt and I were in that room uh, together with some of our other buddies, Adam Roa and you know several other folks like Victoria uh, Foster and um, 
and Andrea Maloney, and we just had a great time that night. And this is the structure inside the pyramid. So you can see the king's chamber, the air shafts, and then all the way down underneath the pyramid, about 150 feet. And underneath the pyramid in the subterranean chamber, there's a well, and then there's a shaft that ends in a wall. Uh, it's about another 80 or so feet. And that shaft is kind of spooky, scary, I'll be honest. Uh, actually, uh, Drunvalo Melchizedek wrote about that shaft and how he was scared going into that shaft. The first time I went into it, I was, uh, I was shit scared too. And uh, it just felt weird in that shaft. There's something different. All the walls inside that are limestone, but they've totally crystallized. So there's dust, unlike every other place in the pyramid, there's not a lot of dust. Um, I don't know that someone comes in and cleans the place, but you don't find dust everywhere. But inside that shaft that ends in a wall at the subterranean chamber, uh, there's probably an inch thick of like crystal dust on the floor all the way through. And there's only enough space in there to literally crawl on your stomach. And you can't even really turn around either. You'd have to be really, really small to be able to turn around in there. Uh, and it's super dark. It is incredibly dark inside there. So uh, this time around, I went very well prepared. I brought one of those like nerd, uh, sort of like head contraptions. So it's got a little flashlight on it and everything. And I was not gonna be left in the dark anywhere because it's a pretty scary place, particularly when you're in the pyramid all by your lonesome. Uh, but you've got the run of the place. But by the way, mind you, just going up and down those freaking stairs in that thing, my legs were sore for days. Okay, so it's not like you're going to run up and down stairs, back and forth, everything, because you would not be able to walk for the next few days. And you're crouched over, so your back hurts, and I'm getting a bit older now, so it was pretty painful, but it was literally the experience of a lifetime. So as you see in the bottom right-hand corner, you're going to see that uh, the pyramid is oriented around four uh, cardinal zodiac signs. Uh, one of them in the upper left is the water bearer, or Aquarius. Then you've got the bull uh, with Taurus. In the bottom right, you have, of course, Leo. Uh, and then in the upper right, you have Scorpio. Now, in ancient times, Scorpio was not referred to as a scorpion. Scorpio in ancient times was always depicted as an eagle. So Scorpion is the only, Scorpio is the only zodiacal sign that goes through this transformative process through their life. You start out as a scorpion, sometimes it turns it into a snake, then from snake it goes into an eagle, then from eagle it goes into a phoenix, and it culminates in the phoenix. It's like an ascension process. And um, your zo zodiac is not only the one in the month that you're born in, but you also have elements of the four cardinals, right? So it'd be three months apart to calculate which other ones are gonna be your orient orientation. Now, of course, uh, Taurus is Earth. I'm Taurus. My birthday is May 16th. And, um, and so my opposite sign would be Scorpio, right? So I have characteristics of Scorpio. Earth sign is Taurus. Water sign is Scorpio, right? And you've got air and, and fire, right, in the other two signs. And so it's like a mixture, how they all basically interplay and work together to figure out, you know, how you end up in your personality, what your identity is, and what your shadow is also. And your shadow is mainly gonna be what you deny in yourself and don't wanna see, and if you wanna take a Myers-Briggs test, it would be your opposite Myers-Briggs test as well, which is actually just as much you. It is your shadow consciousness. And life is all about learning to accept that side of you that you're ashamed of. Because as soon as you can accept that side of yourself that you're ashamed of, then you can truly accept everyone else around you and your whole existence and life dramatically shifts to a higher plane. Now we'll go to the next slide. And this is a, a picture of course of the King's Chamber. And interestingly, the sarcophagus is exactly, it's 89 inches long and 89.62 uh, inches in fact. And it is uh, 38 and a half inches wide. And it just so happens to be the inner dimensions fit precisely over the size of the Ark of the Covenant that's mentioned in the Bible. And you have to make the conversion of the Ark of the Covenant from the biblical cubits to the Egyptian sacred cubit or the royal cubit. And interestingly, that by itself is a mathematical constant. The Egyptian royal cubit uh, is 1.71828 feet. And that 1.71828, for those of you that might be mathematicians on the call, you might recognize the 0.71828 is the same as what you see in Euler number. So the Euler number is 2.71828. So Euler minus one, 
is the Egyptian sacred cubit. Kind of interesting that they had that degree of precision. So I have studied the pyramid inside out, backwards and forwards. I would say that as far as like the mathematical uh, dimensions of the pyramid, and this is not something that you can really go and learn in school. You can learn a pathway to start to study it. But in order for you to get the full benefit from it, you almost have to be an autodidact. That means someone who teaches himself or herself. And then it somehow embeds in your brain and it changes to a degree your way of looking at things in the world. So I started noticing uh, that mathematical constants were embedded in the pyramid even before I was introduced to Alan Green and his work. Um, and there were a few other people that had done similar, but not a lot had been published on it. And there's probably several other people that haven't published at all because I also for a long time had not published or talked about it with anybody until Nassim finally uh, sort of encouraged me and convinced me that I should go ahead and start publishing my work. But I didn't want to do it just in a full access platform. And so I did it through a course on the Resonance Science Foundation and the Academy. And it's now, it was the first elective course that, uh, that they offered. So uh, you can find the course there. And I encourage you, if you want to learn the language of light and the mathematical language that is sort of the universal language and how that has impact on virtually everything, art, music, science, uh, mathematics and philosophy, then I encourage you to take the Etymology of Number course. But what's interesting is that the Bible itself talks about as well the, the four faces on the angel. Now, all of us have seen the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark, I'm sure, right? I was a big fan of, of uh, uh, Indiana Jones. And so I was always wondering, you know, you can never see the faces of the angels with their wings outstretched on the Ark of the Covenant. All the depictions of it, their head's always down. And so I went searching in the Bible to see if I could find any reference to it. And of course, I found it in Ezekiel 1, 4 through 14. And in that section of the Old Testament, it says, as for the likeness of their faces, each had the face of a man. Each of the four had the face of a lion on the right side. Each of the four had the face of an ox on the left side. Each of the four had the face of an eagle. Now, there's that same combination again. It's basically the eagle is Scorpio. The lion, Leo, the face of the man is Aquarius, and the face of the bull is Taurus. And I read further and found that in the camp of Israel, when Moses was leading the children of Israel through 40 years of, you know, tearing through the wilderness, trying to find the land of milk and honey, they had the tabernacle. So uh, the, the story goes that that they crossed through the Red Sea, Moses parted the Red Sea, and everyone was able to cross the Red Sea on dry land, and then Ramses followed him, you've all probably seen the movie, with Charlton Heston on Moses, and you know, the, river, the, the, the whole Red Sea closes on everybody, and everybody like, gets killed, the, the, the Egyptians that are following after them, uh, after they'd already let them go peaceably, after you know, the, the locust storm, the, you know, the death of the firstborn children, all that stuff, right? You remember the story of Pesach, uh, in Hebrew, or the Passover. And what's interesting about it is that there's another reference in the Bible that talks about Moses crossing over the Jordan River. And in that particular reference as well, the same thing happens. They part the, the Jordan River. And with that parting of the Jordan River, with that parting of the Jordan River, basically what happens is that uh, the same exact thing happens. And the point is that it is you are led to believe in the Bible that that Moses was commanded to build the Ark of the Covenant. But, and the exact dimensions of the Ark of the Covenant were given as well. But maybe those dimensions that were given to house the Ark of the Covenant was actually the box that went around the Ark of the Covenant when it was stationary. Now there's a lot of references to the Ark of the Covenant and the holding poles and everything. And Uzziah, the famous one in the Bible in the Old Testament, you're never supposed to try to steady the ark. God knows how to steady himself. So he tries to steady the ark and bam, he gets hit by lightning and he's done, right? This is like, you know, how it all goes down. I believe based on the dimensions inside the Great Pyramid that it is possible that the Ark of the Covenant originally resided within the sarcophagus of stone in the king's chamber. The dimensions are perfectly oriented for that to be the case. And mathematically, they orient around a very perfect mathematical constant that we recently discovered that is related to uh, gravity and time. And we call it the vacuum constant. Now, it is not something we published yet, 
but I found those dimensions precisely inside and related to the Ark of the Covenant itself. And then when I started studying the Bible and I found even this photograph just on a standard Google search of the camp of Israel and the tabernacle, which sat in the middle where Levi is on this picture on the bottom right. We already know that the pyramid is oriented around these four cardinal signs. And now in this picture on the bottom right of the screen, you'll see the camp of Israel was oriented in exact like manner to the same zodiacal cardinal signs as they traveled around in the wilderness for the tabernacle, the tent that was used to house the Ark of the Covenant when they were no longer traveling, because they'd stop in a place for years at times, right? It was a 40-year journey before they made it to the land of Canaan, the land of milk and honey. They kept getting lost. Apparently. So what's interesting to me, though, is I started noticing some consistency in numbers, because if you look at this bottom right uh, photograph, you'll notice that it has Judah off to the right. If you go to Jerusalem today, you'll notice that Jerusalem has symbols everywhere, flags everywhere of a lion, because Judah is represented by the rampant lion. It's the lion standing up like this, and, and, and so that's a very common symbol across all of Jerusalem, and I was just there about a month ago. And, um, and, and so what you also notice is that Leo is sort of always representative of the sun right? It's, it's kind of Apollo. These are the symbology you see of Leo. It's in the middle of summer if you're in the Northern Hemisphere. And what's very interesting is the tribe of Judah, the Issachar, and the Zebulun tribes were all in the same place on this side of the Ark of the Covenant in the tabernacle. So it's shaped like a cross, and Judah was the largest of the tribes. And so Judah is where King David ended up coming through, and you know, the other tribes were sort of lost all the way through Eastern Europe and all the way up into Russia. Uh, and through what's called the diaspora, uh, when King Nebuchadnezzar came from Babylon, took over uh, and destroyed the, uh, the Jerusalem and the, the temple along with it. And then that temple was eventually replaced by Herod's temple in the time of Jesus, right? So this is about 583 BC. But what's interesting is I looked at those numbers and other people probably maybe didn't even notice the numbers, but I noticed the numbers because uh, first of all, the speed of light is 186,400 miles per second. Well, the number of the tribe members of Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun together on this side of this cross that was surrounding the Ark of the Covenant in the tabernacle in the wilderness is 186,400. Now, what a coincidence that that lines up with the sun. And by the way, if I told you that the diameter of the sun is 864,000 miles, the diameter of Jupiter is 86,400 miles, and by the way, that's twice 432, and 432 squared is 186,000 miles also. It's the only number that squares to the speed of light. 432 in music, we all know, is a tuning standard that is used uh, and created by Pythagoras. This is a harmonic frequency that relates to light speed. And you just take one, and you add it or subtract it from the front. That's the same thing with phi. You could look at phi, 1.618, so that's the distance from here to here versus the distance from here to here. This is always going to be about 0.618 or 0.62 versus the distance from here to here, which would be 1.61 versus this distance here, okay? So this is the golden ratio or Fibonacci sequence you've probably all heard about, right? It is sort of nature's mathematics, and it governs how trees grow up and how many branches and leaves and everything end up on that tree or petals on a flower or how your body is shaped. We have receptors all through our body that are looking for five signatures everywhere. That's why our ear is a Fibonacci spiral. That's why the cochlea inside our ear is a Fibonacci spiral. That's why the turbinates inside our nose for our sense of smell are Fibonacci spirals. And that's why our irises and the retinal receptors in the back of our eyes are Fibonacci spirals. It's why our fingerprints are Fibonacci spirals for touch, and our taste buds are Fibonacci spirals. We're constantly looking for this signature of Fibonacci of phi 1.618. Now, what's interesting to me is that in the speed of light, you have it 1.864, but you take the one off the front just like you do with 0.618 for baby phi or little phi versus big phi 1.618. Interesting that our sun has the exact same uh, dimension or diameter as this number of the number of the tribe of Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, which matches the sun, 
also matches the lion. Now, what about the other ones on here? Well, interesting to me also that Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin, the opposite of the sun on the right is a moon-related number because the radius of the moon is 1,080, right? And kind of interesting that they show up as opposite sides of each other. This is in the Bible written thousands of years ago. Boy, oh boy, how could they have known this? And all you got to do is take 864, cut that in half, you get 432. Cut that in half, you get 216. Cut that in half, you get 108, right? It's an octable re relationship of each other. And any one of you can find these references in the Bible, in the Old Testament. And then the Dan, Naphtali, and Asher is 157,600. Well, strangely, that's the gamma constant in mathematics plus one. So that's euler mascheroni constant, 1.577 to be exact is the euler mascheroni constant. And then at the bottom side of that, so euler mascheroni and its opposite is going to somehow relate to pi. And what a surprise, but 51.4 degrees and a compass reading comes out to be the same slope angle as the Great Pyramid itself, which relates to pi because it's the 0.14 of 3.14 multiplied by 360 degrees. It is a pi reference. So here on this one chart of the camp of Israel, we have light speed that relates to the sun's diameter, the moon's radius, which also of course relates to its diameter. You have as well the euler mascheroni constant, which relates to angular momentum and spin in physics. And on the bottom side, we have a pi reference. What a surprise. And by the way, euler divided by pi equals 0.864. So, just a little mystery to put in there for everyone on the day. Now let me take it to the next level. Because the word pyramid means fire in the middle, it can also be used synonymous with light. Because, you know, you're carrying torches around, it's like, we need some light, we need some fire. Well, what's interesting to me is that, of course, pyramid or pyramid in Greek, mid is a measurement, it's the center point, the mean, the median, right? So light's middle or mid or light's measurement, light's mean. Now, this was kind of freaky for me because, uh, of course, I decided to look up on Google uh, what are the coordinates. I encourage all of you to do it. What are the coordinates, longitude and latitude of the Great Pyramid? And, of course, with the Great Pyramid, even if you believe that it was built in dynastic Egypt by Khufu, which I do not, um, it's interesting because there was no latitude or longitude when the pyramid was built, right? It's not like we built the latitude and longitude system off of the pyramid, although we like to say pyramid is sort of the center of the Earth's landmass. We've all probably heard that commentary before. But what's interesting is that the latitude of the Great Pyramid in the center of the King's Chamber, in the sarcophagus in the King's Chamber, down to one meter accuracy, is this number right on top. It's 29. 0.9792458 degrees north latitude. It's the center of the sarcophagus in the Great Pyramid. And it just so happens that the speed of light is the exact same number, down to one meter accuracy. So 299,000, uh, 299,792,458 meters per second is the speed of light in meters per second. And here we have the exact latitudinal reference for the Great Pyramid, center of the sarcophagus, center of the King's Chamber, or the inside side of the King's Chamber, excuse me, is exactly the same number. Oh, is that coincidence? That's a pretty damn good coincidence. That's impressive, right? That'd be like, what are the chances? What are the odds of that? But what about the longitude? So let's look at the longitude. And what I found out was that uh, it's 31.1342 uh, degrees east. And we knew that the Egyptian calendar was a 360-day calendar. Every day had one degree. And this, by the way, was the identical calendar used by the Sumerians as well, a 360-day calendar. So they didn't, they didn't use the extra five days. So then some people ask, well, was the year shorter then? I don't know. The Egyptians, at least in dynastic Egypt, explained it. They said, well, they had five days of sort of like, you know, catch-up days at the end of every year. Uh, between Christmas and New Year's, and this is when they would wait. You know, they'd have Sirius go down and then resurrect back up again at the end of the year, and so this was part of their whole process. Sirius is the brightest star in the night sky, and we already know there's a lot of alignments of the Great Pyramid associated with Sirius. 
But what I did is I found this language and part of the things you learn in the etymology of number course is you learn how to convert decimals into references of degrees on a circle. And when I took that same 31.1342 and divided into 36, or in this case, 360 degrees, because 36 is just a smaller fractal of 360 degrees, then I get that same ratio again of 0.864. Remember, light speed is 1.864, only this time it's in miles per second, not meters. So, whoa, wait a minute. So both the latitude and the longitude of the pyramid are light speed references, one in meters and the other in miles. Now, that's where I start to separate out and say, okay, that can't really be a coincidence, right? And now I just gave you a number as well of phi, 1.618, and then numbers behind that. Well, I just so happen to want to run the calculation on the nautical miles, because I have to do with the mile versus the nautical mile, it's 1.151, miles is a nautical mile. So you divide 186,400 by 1.151, then you get the nautical miles, right, for the speed of light, and what a surprise, it ends up very close to phi itself. 1618, in this case, 1619. So there were no nautical miles that were even created. There was no, like, you know, latitude, longitude measurements of the pyramid. Now let's keep pulling on this string because obviously I started wondering, wait a minute, was the pyramid built in the future and set backwards in time? Because there's so much you had to presuppose, right? To have that much advanced technology in the pyramid. And remember, it's two and a half million stones, each stone weighing 30 to 70 tons, 20 to 70 tons. Let's be real. We calculated a reasonable number of years to build the Great Pyramid as it stands right now. And we could never do it with our technology today, guaranteed is about 583 years. Yeah. <laughs> Who's going to do that? Like, okay, I think I'm going to die in 583 years. So I'm going to set my burial place up now so that my great, 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 great grandchildren will have a place where they can die and they can have a burial place. Not likely, right? I mean, so realistically, they know the pyramid had to have been built in like 20 years. That's like a ridiculous number of gigantic stones that have been put in place every second. Not realistic. Now, the other thing I look at here is that all these side lengths, and this is all done in feet. What we learned, and, and Alan Green also learned this, is the foot, the, the sacred cubit, 1.71828 feet, the meter, right? All of these measurements in the centimeter are embedded as constants within the pyramid. So as an example, the base width of the pyramid is approximately one-seventh of one mile. One note of an octave, right? An octave of seven notes. By the way, pi itself can be derived as looking at three octaves closed, which would be 22 notes. You start on C, end up on, you know, the next three octave up C, and you're gonna end up with 22 total notes in between there. And then you divide that by one open octave, which ends at B rather than closing it out to C, that's pi, 22 over seven. Three octaves divided by one open octave, that's pi. Now, interesting, right, that all of these measurements, and you can take the dimensional references and say, I'm going to take the base width, 756 feet, I'm going to divide that by the height, 481 feet, what a surprise, I end up at gamma. It's that same number that we looked on the page for the Camp of Israel. I'm going to take the side, right, uh, of the pyramid, the slope up, and I'm going to divide that by the height, and I'm going to end up at phi, the, the basically phi, uh, square uh, square rooted, right? And phi squared. I can do this with all of the measurements of the pyramid, and I end up with all these perfect, absolutely perfect, transcendental, irrational numbers. And not only that, but if you actually look at the lengths themselves, you might recognize the 718 on the side there of the pyramid going up on its corner. Well, that's the same 718 as the 1.718. That's Euler now minus 2 because Euler is 2.718. We all get stuck on the decimal points, where the decimal points sit. In a fractal universe, it doesn't matter. It moves from wherever your reference point is, right? It's a fractal that just goes up and down. You just move that decimal both directions, wherever you're looking at it from. So that's the same 718. And in fact, the 222.22, 22, 
If you divide that number by 360 in this language of light that you learned through the course, you end up with 0.618 of a circle. There's your phi number again. 0.618 is phi. And 38.2, if I take 1 and subtract, or 100 and subtract 38.2, what do I get? 61.8. That's alpha. That's the alpha constant, which is the mirrored opposite. It's the darkness of phi's light. So all of these measurements I started really, really in-depth studying. And as I got deeper and deeper into this, I found more and more patterns and connections. Every single mathematical constant that exists on the face of the earth that has been discovered today, and probably many that have not yet been discovered, are embedded in the proportional dimensions of the Great Pyramid. Now, is that surprising to you, Matt? It's amazing, man. It's well, your whole your whole course is amazing. I just want to give you an FYI, though. You got three minutes to two if you got to go me meet Nassim. So, uh, I'll just give you that. And and for those of you guys watching, definitely do the course. It's this mind blowing the entire time. There's so much more. So I'm going to take you through this real quick. So what I found is that on a circle, all the major mathematical constants, which are pi, tau, rho, gamma, Euler, and the speed of light, are just musical notes that end up on a seven-sided heptagon, okay? Because the pyramid is built on dimensions of seven and 11 and seven and 22. It's all related to pi. So I also then discovered that Euler, which is 19 over seven divided by pi, 22 over seven, gives us the speed of light if you just add one to the front of it. And that again gives you as well the dimensions, the diameter dimension of our sun. So the greatest mystery ever in physics is this number called 137. It's the 33rd prime number. Einstein, Richard Feynman said about it, we don't understand this number, right? It comes to us with no understanding by man. You might say the hand of God wrote that number, and we don't know how he pushed his pencil. And there's a great book by him and Carl Jung and, and Wolfgang Pauli that is titled In Search of the Mysterious 137. because when Richard Feynman died, he was in a hospital. They took him to his room, and he knew. He told the nurse, and he says, I'm going to die here. And she said, why? And he said, look at the room number, and it was 137 in his hospital. He knew that somehow that was sort of like a beginning and ending for him. So we all know this tetragrammaton, which is Yahweh. Right, And it's read backwards. It's right to left because that's Hebrew. And everyone would know that these are sort of Yod, He, Vav, He. So I didn't look at it, even though I speak Hebrew, as Hebrew. I knew that Hebrew is a mathematical language. And so I looked at it, well, maybe it's a mathematical equation. And if it were a mathematical equation, what would it look like? Well, how about pi to the seventh power, reading from the right, over pi times seven. Now, I thought to myself, I swear, if this thing comes out to 137, I'm going to literally shit myself. I will die, right? Because this is going to freak me out. I don't know what to do if this happens, right? So I did the math. And of course, pi times 7 is 22, right? Pi times 7 is 22. And pi to the seventh power is 3,020. So if you put 22 over 3,020, you divide 3,020 by 22, what do you get? 137. And that is a mathematical constant called alpha. So here, this name of God in the Bible, Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton, is a mathematical equation that is named alpha. So I learned that there's only one constant. In fact, this one constant creates this pattern that derives down itself to 5.16. And that's the merger of a pentagon and a hexagon. And the bent pyramid in Darshur is based on the combination of pentagon and hexagon. The slope angles would be equivalent to those that would be hexagonal as well as pentagonal. And you create a male and a female constant off of this one Yahweh constant, which gives us 1 over 137, or alpha, the beginning. And out of that, you can now form all, on the left side, all the phi constants, all phi related, phi squared, which is all spirality. And on the right, you form all the constants that are governing things like gravity. And those constancies related to gravity 
come out in the form of Euler. Those two in combination form what we perceive as light and sound. And half notes of sound are related to 0.71, that's Euler minus two. And full notes are 0.14, so you double Euler, right, minus two, and you end up with pi minus three. And pi is each musical note coming successively up a spiral scale. And here's the bent pyramid at Darshur, and of course, I couldn't help but notice that, gee, that looks like a giant A, right? You've got this giant A, and someone said to me, oh, well, you know, if they're going to leave a signature on the sarcophagus, why don't they just put it on the outside of the pyramid? And I'm like, maybe they did. Could just be a giant A. So this 516 has a natural marriage and merger because you notice the first angle of incidence on the 5 or the pentagon is 72 degrees. The sum of angles of a hexagon is 720 degrees. That makes it a natural marriage as an upfractal pairing. And through a Vesca Pisces, you end up with the one right in the center that acts like a mirror that merges those two worlds from the material and the immaterial worlds into one. So this is a picture of what I was drawing on the flight over to Egypt from Israel. And I was drawing out this perfect Vesca Pisces and positioning the A, the crossbar on the A, exactly where it needed to be, and it relates to flower of life. And this particular placing of it creates a particular ratio, because it's not the center of the circle. You would see the line that you see here in the center, uh, you know, with the Vesca Pisces, that would be the center of the circle. It's slightly higher than that, and you could see that it's got a differential between that, that circular point, which would be the center of that, or the apex of that circle, would be where you would have the center of the next circle, but in this case, it's a little bit higher. And the reason for that separation is because it creates a phi relationship in proportionality so that the center of that A becomes an alpha phi relationship. So even the letter A has proportionality of perfection that relate to the constancies. So I was drawing this and the inverse of an A looks kind of like an M. So if you, if you made a box, right, and, and blackened the box, and you lightened out the center part of it, and you flipped it upside down, then you have an A. And if you did the opposite of it, you'd have an M, which is interesting, right? It's like an inverse relationship of each other. And of course, the implication of that around I am were interesting to me, so I looked at it. So then I started looking at the King's Chamber, and while I was there, Alan Green had asked me to go and buy a little, like, precision laser pointer measurer. You can get them at Home Depot. So I did that. While I was there, I was measuring the King's Chamber like crazy. And the guys that were there, the guards uh, that were there were like freaking out. They're like, what are you doing? What are you doing? I'm like, oh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. So I'm measuring the room. He wanted to know if, if the sarcophagus of stone could be fit through either one of the potential doors. There's one uh, door that is uh, sort of hypothesized off on the right side of the sarcophagus there. And yes, it would fit through there. And the other door is on the other side of the room, and that's the one you'll remember, Matt. Uh, we crouched through that door, and it fits perfectly through there too, but it's only a half inch clearance on all sides. So, it, and this is not exactly a light thing, okay? So it's all made of rose granite. Uh, as you can see here, the pyramid, you know, the builders didn't have an eye for kind of like leaving any decorations behind. It's pretty much as austere as austere gets, and plain Jane. And you see the length of the sarcophagus is 89.62 inches, and the height is uh, 41 and a half, and the width is 38.5. And, uh, and, and so what I did is I measured, because Alan asked me to, I measured the volume of the sarcophagus versus the volume of the king's chamber, and what do you think? One over 137. What a surprise, there's your alpha again. So while I was in there, one of my buddies is like laying down and I'm like taking pictures, everything. They're not supposed to be letting us take pictures, but they, you know, they don't really care about the tourists that go in there. It's the ones who are on to try to find something that they get freaked out about. So while he was laying down in there, I looked down on the side, the far side. Uh, you can see the little purple circle uh, where the room's orientation is. And lo and behold, it had been in my consciousness already, the shape of the letter A. So then I notice somehow in the rose granite on the surface of the rim, there's a letter A. And right next to it looks like there's an omega. And then off to the right of that and down the side of the sarcophagus, I see 
a compass with a circle, even to the degree where there are degree markings in between the legs of the compass. And I had known, of course, that there's not supposed to have been any writing found. In fact, the only writing ever found that suggested Khufu was the builder was this red paint that was left by purportedly the builders of the pyramid, the mathematicians of it, above the king's chamber in these tiny crawl shaft chambers that are above it, uh, this fellow by the name of Weiss in 1839 who led an exhibition that cost a lot of money and he had some big investors behind him. Some people believe, including Graham Hancock, who just when I presented this that night, I presented it, released a, 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 a whole news story on how Weiss was proven as a hoax to appease his investors. He used red paint to paint in that upper chamber and that's the only reference and why we call it Khufu Right? The whole pyramid is Khufu's pyramid. It, th that's not adequate proof. And, and even Graham Hancock now, as well as many other scholars, and many for a long time have believed that there was a good chance that that was a hoax, uh, that that paint up there was left as a hoax. So that means if, if you discount the quality of that finding, or purported finding in 1839, then this is the only real writing in the pyramid, other than some graffiti that you'll find in different places. So here's a horizontal view of it, and, and off to the bottom right, you'll see my little laser measurer that I bought. It's a Bosch one. It's pretty cool. And um, so you can see the alpha and the omega here, but to help you see it, and, and the peak of the A is very, very pronounced. And this doesn't look like it's done by a graffiti artist, that's for sure. And so you can see it back and forth here. So then what about the other symbol? Uh, it makes a perfect 30 degree angle. Looks familiar. It's got a little bit of this uh, Freemason thing on it, which is kind of bizarre. And very often architects in history have left their signature next to their architect seal, which often includes the instrument of the, geog the, the, the geometry expert or the architect himself, which is the compass. So I couldn't like leave well enough alone. I had four Egyptologists with me, and they're like, okay, Robert, you're like a mathematician on the pyramid, so why don't you analyze these things? So there I did. I started doing the measurements and everything, and I found that it was 5.6 inches across. Knowing already that 5.6 inches is fundamental, that's, again, your pentagon and hexagon uh, relationship. And then I measured the length of the A, which was 3.24 inches. I found it interesting that that's exactly 2 phi, so 1.618 or 1.62 is phi. So I've got two phi there. And the length of the, the width of the A is uh, the 3.24, and I divide that into 5.6, and now I've got the gamma constant again, which is really interesting. And I knew also that 1.86 was important, and what a surprise, but the height of the omega is 1.86 inches. The width is 1.62. So you've got this perfect phi relationship again. And lo and behold, every single constant that is embedded in the pyramid is embedded right inside of these two letters that are embossed on the edge of the sarcophagus of stone. Now, what's also interesting is that if you measure this across the 89.62 inches, the, the peak of the alpha ends up at 0.37, which is alpha minus one. There's that 137 again. 37 is actually the 12th prime number. And the 21st prime number is 73. So you've got this interesting palindrome relationship where you transpose both of these numbers. 12, the 12th prime is 37. The 21st prime is 73. They're both palindromes. So, uh, and they're all prime numbers. And what you also notice is that the halfway point, the median point between the alpha and the omega is exactly 31.4 inches from the right side of the sarcophagus, which, of course, what is pi times 10? 31.4. Not a surprise because the length of the king's chamber, not including the door, is exactly 31.4 feet. So all of the constants that are embedded. Now, we also know 33 is kind of an important number because 33 relates to ascension, 33 vertebrae in our spine. We've probably heard this before. 33 years of the life of Jesus Christ. All of these things kind of combine. And, and the 33rd degree of Freemasonry, it's called the Knights Templar uh, degree in the York Rite of, um, of Freemasonry. Rosicrucianism 
you find 33 everywhere. It's the Phoenix stage of ascension, of these degrees of ascension that are through alchemy, which start with Negredo, Albedo, uh, Citronidas, which is the peacock, and then it goes into the pelican and the rubedo, and then it ends with the stage of the phoenix, and the stage of the phoenix and the thunderbird merging. And that always stuck out to me because I, I went to graduate school in Phoenix at a school called Thunderbird. So I always kind of wondered why uh, the phoenix is always like red and the thunderbird is always blue. And it took me quite a while to finally figure out, oh, they're kind of shadows of each other, kind of interesting in alchemy. So either the people that left these markings were graffiti artists who had incredible instrumentation that measured everything to perfection the degree of which would only be matched by the pyramid builders themselves. Or this may have actually been markings left by the pyramid builders themselves. Now, the Egyptologists I had with me, after I showed them the mathematical analysis, they all believed that that was more likely the case. So then I had to ask the question, how could this be? That there's no record anywhere in antiquity history anywhere since you know, Khaled al-Mamun broke into the pyramid in the ninth century, there's no record of any writing having been found. And you would think the one place, if the architect was gonna sign you know, his master work, his magnum opus, that he would sign the most important stone, the most prominent prodigious stone of the two and a half million stones that are used to build the Great Pyramid, don't you think that he would have signed it right there and nobody found it? It's kind of incredible. And this 33 also matches up to the hexagram, as we can see, and 66. So why is that? Because you, know, you can take the points on the circle and the first equilateral triangle, its bottom right angle will be at 0.33 of 360 degrees or 120 degrees. So 0.33 and 0.66 make the hexagram or the merger of male and female. The descending or downward pointing triangle is feminine and the ascending upward pointing triangle is masculine. The merger of male and feminine energy. Now, it didn't just stop there because I also looked at the omega and I said, okay, proportionally I know how the omega is, that's the height, it's related to light speed. What about the two angles, where do they land on a circle? for the bottom part of the omega. And surprise, surprise, the very center of both of them, geometrically perfect again, land at 137, which is alpha, and 222.5, which is 0.618 of 360 degrees, which is phi. So alpha is darkness and absorbed light. Phi is reflected light. Now in physics, we see colors like, you know, I have my little phone case here, it's black and it's gold, but it's not really black and gold. Um, this rose I have is red, but it's not really red. This is the reflection of red. You'll remember back in science class that this actually isn't red, it's reflecting red, it's absorbing a greenish blue color. Where does that greenish blue color go? It has to go somewhere. Is it in another dimension? Is that dark matter? What is it? This is the difference between alpha and, in this case, alpha on the right and phi. One is reflected, the other is absorbed. There's a mirror right down the center of these two dimensional planes. So obviously, this could all have been coincidental. I don't know, like the latitude and longitude being perfectly light speed in both miles and meters per second. Kind of amazing. Maybe it's coincidence, maybe it's not. So I started looking at this deeper, and of course I found that uh, Alpha and Omega, you know, there's only one guy that claims to have built the pyramid. It's not Khufu, it's not Kefren, it's not Menkari, it's not any of these dudes that they've got names on the pyramid for now. There's one guy that actually wrote in the Emerald Tablets and said, I built the pyramid. Right? It's like, that's kind of audacious, right? Who is gonna basically say, I built the pyramid and just have it be a hoax? Even those guys that are famous in antiquity and dynastic Egypt, that you know, wrote something about the pyramid, they never said they built it. They only ever referred, the word used was restored it. So when you look at alpha and omega, and of course we, we don't have to talk too much about the alpha and the omega and the esoteric meanings 
of that and the importance in the Bible in reference to Jesus, as well as the second coming, as well as the you know, revelations by John. Alpha is a word that means bull. It means ox. Aleph is the Hebrew letter for A. And of course, if you flip it upside down, it looks like a bull, right? You take the A upside down, it's got two bull horns, there you go. Pretty simple. And omega is a feminine symbol that looks an awful like the symbol for Venus. It's also meant to represent a womb. So alpha and omega. Now, Thoth was the only guy who said, I built the pyramid. He says it right here. Um, you know, built I the great pyramid, pattern after the pyramid of earth force, burning eternally so that it too might remain through the ages. And basically re references you know, several times in the Emerald Tablets of Thoth that he built the pyramid. Okay, so he's the one guy that said, but nobody wants to believe that, right? Nobody wants to believe because, I mean, come on, that's kind of crazy, especially it says the Atlantean at the end. But what if Alpha and Omega actually related to Thoth? You have on the side here, and who is Thoth, right? Who is this guy? What's the deal? He's Mercury, right? He's a Hermes Trace Majestus, thrice crown. You've got the male Taurus on the left side, and then you've got the female Venus on the right side. You merge those two together, and you get this kind of hermaphroditic Mercury. And both of those merged together make this perfect symbol of Thoth or Mercury. So you could probably argue that Alpha and Omega would be the signature for the guy, other than just having this symbol right here of Thoth. Say, I'm, I'm going to stamp this on here. It's the same one they use in astrology and alchemy. I'm going to stamp this on the edge of the pyramid. Actually, by leaving Alpha and Omega, he actually did. And what's necessary is to have those mathematical constants to know that it was actually potentially the beard builder that left it, because I don't think a graffiti guy would know how to do this. So you got Alpha and Omega. Venus is Omega, it's feminine. Alpha is male energy. Off to the left here, you'll see the, the Egyptian god Thoth that always had sort of a bird's head. And he's always holding in his right hand the Omega symbol. And then you've got Mercury Hermes here, which is always also holding the Staff of Caduceus. The Staff of Caduceus is what doctors use when they want to signify that they are healers or healthcare providers. Alpha and Omega is a potential related to Thoth. So we see the combination here, and I've already said that pi times seven divided by pi to the seventh power is one over 137. But what if there's another thing that's embedded inside that Thoth? Now, in Hebrew, they don't use vowels. So there's no like circle or O in between the letters, right? So you, you kind of read Hebrew, it's like reading the word please now. Nobody writes please anymore on text. They just say PLS, right? You sort of imply the E-A-S-E -E, and you just get away with it by saying PLS. Well, Hebrew is kind of the same way. It's kind of an abbreviated language. You don't have to put uh, between consonants the vowels. You can kind of fill the vowels because you know the language well enough. And so reading it, from right to left, you see that there's Yahweh again up in the top, Thoth, you've got the Phoenix, you've got the Thunderbird. This is a Rosicrucian uh, painting from uh, about 500 years ago, dark female moon, water, earth, Diana. On the left side, this worlds are inversed, light, male, sun, air, fire, Apollo. Maybe there's something to this, that this bridge between this higher dimensional plane of Yahweh. And by the way, there are 33 heads up there of angels, uh, which is interesting, 500 year old painting. And you've got the Phoenix and the crow on the left side there, which represents the Grado. Then uh, Albedo, which is the whitening of the white swan. The, uh, the, the uh, peacock, which is in the bottom center. And then the pelican, which represents Rubedo, peacock is Citronitas, and then the Phoenix stage. Uh, what's interesting is you see the woman uh, shackled somehow into this realm and the man shackled in this realm. You've got the rampant lion and the man holding the sun, which represents Apollo. And you've got Thoth in the middle that is sort of bridging the gap between these two realms or existences. And what if, if we wrote it out and read it backwards, you could see that a seven looks an awful lot like a T and an H, and that's actually the sound that it makes. Yod-Heh, Vav-Heh. 
the T, H, no O. So that's something that's just, I'll leave as a question. What is Thoth? I don't know. Uh, I know that there's a lot of work left back behind a guy that we don't know very much about at all, who claims to have built the pyramid. Um, and perhaps we should ask the questions, you know, should we be learning more about this mystical Thoth, who is also claimed to be a Greek god and the passer of all wisdom, etc. Now, I'll leave you on uh, one other thing. I'm going to go now to uh, this paper. So can you just do this for me real quick? So I'm going to show you the, uh, the discovery that, uh, that we made on prime numbers very quickly. And uh, should be able to come up here. It's just right there. Do we have it? There it is. Okie doke. So I'm going to go to the next page. So how do I do that? Just push down here. That one. Okay. So this is my first publication. Actually, this is the second one that we did. And this is on prime number determinacy. So what we found was, and that's good enough for now, and then we'll go to the next page in a moment. What we found was that every number into infinity ends up on one of these uh, sort of axes. Uh, and there are four, but they show up as eight, of course. They double when they cross. And it's at the north, south, east, and west poles. Uh, we also found that the mathematical constants all emerge in decimal as well as degree references out of the centers of those prime numbers. So these green numbers here are what's called Q primes. They're divisible only by other prime numbers and products of primes. And it's actually derived very easily. You just simply do a multiplication table of all those numbers within those moduli. And every number that doesn't show up is highlighted within those moduli. So modulus one would be the column of one, starting with one as you go around a 24 hour clock. Modulus five and seven, 11, 13, 17, 19, and 23, in each of those columns into infinity, you only have two kinds of numbers that show up in seven of those columns. And in one of those columns, you have three. In the first column, you see yellow color here. And those yellow ones are prime squared. So that's how you can tell that you've locked in the sequence because all prime squares, five times five equals 25, and you'll see that's the first number there. Uh, seven times seven is 49. 121 is 11 times 11, and 13 times 13 is 169, and then take that up to 289, which is 17 times 17. 19 times 19 is 361. They end up in the exact same spot into infinity. This is the only pattern that has this unique variance, this and, and, and a pattern of 12 as well. And then what you also notice is that in all the other moduli, if it's not a quasi-prime, like the number 119, if you look at the north, whole side of this above 95, you'll find 119. That's a quasi prime because it's divisible by 119, right? And the number one, but it's also divisible by seven times 17, both of which are prime numbers. Therefore, it ends up in this lineup right here. Now this only happens on this 24 hour clock or the geometry of an Icasi tetragon, a 24 sided polygon. Now what's interesting is that we have 24 hours in a day, of course, so 24 hours in a day, has an importance related to something else. And that is that it relates to time. And if you can imagine that we have 24 hours in a day, wouldn't somehow the 24 hours in a day have some relationship to the diameter and potentially the radius of the earth as it spins? Well, is it a surprise then that if I add up the sum of angles, which the interior angle of a 24 sided polygon is 165 degrees, if I multiply that 165 degrees, by 24 sides, 24 angles, that I end up with 3,960. What a surprise, but that is the exact radius of our Earth in miles. The two should be related. Now, whoever created the mile, we know it's fundamental, obviously had a much higher understanding than probably we could calculate today. So what's interesting, though, is in each of these moduli, if it's not a quasi-prime, then it must be prime. So every number into infinity, and we can calculate using simple multiplication without any factorization using very little computer power or energy, we can calculate primes into infinity where they should land. 
And is it any surprise then that that's what we did and every number that's not generated by multiplying the prime numbers together must therefore in each of those modulus be prime by definition. So now we have an infinite series of primes and those are the red numbers you see on the left. But we didn't even do it for that reason. We did it to understand the constants, which are the blue column on the right. Every mathematical constant that has the potential to merge the world and physics between strong force and weak force that Albert Einstein himself was trying to crack for many, many decades, but could never crack, to merge the worlds of quantum physics and the standard model, now I think is at our very fingertips. Because in order to have a unified physics model, we must have a unified mathematical model that underlies that physical model. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and end here. I'm very, very excited about today. Uh, great things are happening today. And uh, I'm loving the now. And I'm looking forward, but just enjoying the moment as it is right now. The looking forward part is uh, sort of secondary. And I'm thrilled about the direction and how everything is going. Everything's happening for a good reason. And uh, I'm very, very honored and grateful to have been invited by you today, Matt, to, uh, to present on your show. Amazing, man. Just truly freaking extraordinary. Thanks so much for your time and coming on and all your work. I know you got to get going and I appreciate you uh, fitting me in on your busy schedule. Um, thanks so much, man. Um, the only thing that I'll say to that is the Tho thing I had, a, we discussed it once in private, but I, I talked about it in public. It was a very fifth dimensional extraordinary experience that I can't explain. So there's, there's something to all this and it seems like you're, you're starting to put some puzzle pieces together as far as the math goes and even the physics goes. So just tons of love to you, man. Ex absolutely extraordinary work. Thank you, my friend. You have a great day. I look forward to seeing you and we're going to get up to Maine soon. Yes. Sounds good. Okay, brother. Right. Have a good one. See Bye -bye. ya. Bye.